first an apology. Uh, when the, the title was due, uh, I had all kinds of grand, grand plans to integrate all kinds of geoscience into this, this talk. Uh, I, I had to st stick mostly with, um, with the available uh, geochemical data, as just last night I was given a structural model that, that I can't wait to integrate, but didn't make it into the talk today, so sorry about that. Um, Baldwin, uh, Baldwin's been mined for at least 600 years, and um, yeah, Chinese people were there already uh, uh, in the Middle Ages extracting silver. Um, so it's got a long history. So I've got a couple of uh, slides, the history of Baldwin. I've got to acknowledge Neil Reynolds of CSA who's put this together. Also, well, also he, he dragged me into the project to begin with, so it's all, uh, <laughs> I'll blame it all on him. Um, so Baldwin history goes back at least to the 15th century, um, 1400s. Uh, the Chinese, as I, as I mentioned, and they, they um, so the, the district was known, and uh, the Namtu district, that is. So then uh, later in, uh, in, in the 1900s, um, of course, the Brits was, were there, and it was part of the, uh, the, the, the great empire. Um, and in 1912, uh, the Burma Corporation actually really got, in, it got involved and put, put a big investment up that was uh, mainly initiated by Herbert Hoover. And um, Herbert Hoover, of course, is the, uh, he later became the US president. Uh, and a fun fact that I didn't know until this week that I was you know, re reading up on things um, is that Herbert's wife, Lou, was actually a geologist. And uh, so they, they made a fine GMAT couple, but, but not only that, um, she actually knew Latin and she knew geology, and they had a copy of the Re Metallica. And she and Herbert actually were the first to publish the Re Metallica in English. So they translated from, from Latin to English. So I thought it was a, a neat anecdote. Anyway, so that, that got pushed, and it pushed pretty hard because here the, 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 they were uh, running down a shaft of 522 meters already and a two and a half kilometer tunnel. Uh, back in the, in the early 20th century to, uh, to extract uh, uh, lead and silver mainly. And uh, so at the time, it was really one of the richest mines in the, in the British Empire. And uh, um, so here's some of the historic adders here, and, and you can see the, see the rail lines go in. Um, sorry, I'm pointing at the screen that you, most of you can't see. Uh, <laughs> so. One of the things that, that's, that's, that's a bit tricky now is that, uh, because drilling is ongoing, um, you know, you run into these kinds of, uh, um, well, not, not the added per se, but there's, there's deep stopes that are all wood supported. So there's hard wood supported backfilled stopes that were, you know, and um, most of the times the, the diamond drill wins and sometimes uh, the wood actually uh, throws in uh, uh, a bit of a uh, wrench there. So, um, so this is what it, what it currently looks like. As I said before, it's a significant producer. It's been a significant producer of lead, zinc, and silver uh, all throughout the early uh, 1900s. Um, then in uh, 53, the estimated deposit size, that, that, well, it was estimated that it had contained 11 million tons at 23% uh, lead, 14% zinc, and 1% copper, and, um, and uh, uh, 540 grams silver. So pretty rich when you're really mining those, those stopes. Uh, then in the Second World War, um, the mine and smelter got destroyed. Later, uh, the project was nationalized uh, by, uh, uh, in, in Burma, as it was known at the time. And then in the, the 80s, it, it sort of, well, it declined. The resources depleted and, and uh, investment declined. So there wasn't actually, you know, there wasn't any real near mine exploration done to, uh, to extend the life of mine. Um, until uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, it was revived uh, a little bit with an open pit mine and um, there's some struggling you know recoveries uh, but the mining plant still you know w went on to to operate till uh, till recently so um, on the right you can see the uh, the, the current uh, well you see the, the pit outline of what's been mined over those 30 years um, uh, from surface and you can see here on the, and the, on the bottom you see that the main um, uh, the, the main stopes and the, 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 the ore bodies that they were defined. China is 
formerly known as Chinaman, was really where they knew that the Chinese had mined at the surface, so that was named after that. It's offset by these transform faults, and uh, there's, there's these three bodies that are um, discontinuous because of those, uh, those strike-slip faults that run, run across um, the system. Uh, apart from those near vertical three major faults, not much was done in terms of uh, uh, detailed structural modeling, uh, which, as I mentioned before, is only, uh, is only really completed uh, this week. So a little bit uh, about the current work that's going on. So Myanmar Metals um, did some work over the past two years. Uh, they're really part of a joint venture, the Baldwin uh, joint venture. Um, so they've captured historical data and, uh, and, and, and managed to actually put together a reasonable story to, to, to keep going and, and get back in there. So with a lot of mapping and channel sampling and drilling, um, they actually got the, the project up, back up and running. And they also, uh, yeah, they put so a first um, resource was put together with an indicated and inferred uh, uh, estimate of 82 million tons at 4.7 lead, 119 gram silver, and uh, uh, 2.4 2 zinc and 0.2 copper. So now, of course, it's a, it's a more significant resource. And they also uh, decided that they wanted to you know, bring in uh, uh, you know, the expertise to, to make this a success in, in instead of just you know, trying to keep applying the old, uh, the old concept. So um, there is a, a, a startup pit is being designed, there's actually the resource is still being updated for the, for, for the next, next stage and uh, so subsequent plans are, are, are still uh, on the way. So this is very much a work in progress. So there's huge upside in, the, in, in this deposit and uh, historically it's been described as a VMS but VMS is not really appropriate term in this, in this environment. Uh, it's a structurally controlled magnetic hydrothermal system that, um, uh, that, that occurs in the Baldwin uh, volcanic center. So definitely the heat source can be you know, ascribed to uh, the, the rhyolites and the, the rhyolite domes and, and, and system present. So it's definitely a volcanic center, but um, the VMS, is, it's not a typical VMS. So there's high grade loads and, and the surrounding halo and there's, there's multi-stage mineralization. So there's lead zinc mineralization, there's also lead mineralization and there's zinc mineralization and then there's copper and, um, and uh, so unassociated with, with these direct loads, uh, there's also copper and uh, nickel and some cobalt. Um, so it's really critical to get the metallurgy right because it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a simple system. Um, so uh, yeah, and of course, as opposed to what Warren was mentioning earlier, uh, we're not doing this nicely in sequence where, you know, if, if only those Chinese in 1400 had collected all the right data, we would now know what to do. Um, but, so we're, we're, we're tied a little bit for, for time. Um, so anyway, so let's, let's get into what we, what we can do with the current data. Um, so one of the first things you do when you, when you get into this space uh, is to sort of like uh, scope out what you need to know. What do we need to know about this deposit? How is it going to process? Um, what, so not only, we're not just interested in, in, in grade, but how is it distributed? What mineralogy is involved? And how is that going to affect the processing and um, you know, the, sort of the mining processing and even reclamation? So uh, when we put together these, these types of models and we, we're looking at geomet domains really, so, uh, and I'm glad that, that Warren gave the, uh, the introductions to that already. Um, so geomet domains in this case, uh, you know, they're, they're really, well not in this case, in, in all cases, they're spatial domains of characteristic mineralogy really. So principally it's mineralogy. If, o if only we would measure just mineralogy for everything, um, you know, quantitatively uh, in great detail, then we'd be happy too. But, the cost of that is still prohibitive. So what we have to do with, with, with proxies from geochemistry from, uh, and, and geophysics and other, uh, you know, petrophysics, et cetera. So geomet domains, spatial domains of characteristic mineralogy that affect the comminution. So how is it going to be crushed and, and ground up? Um, the metallurgy, so the recovery and, and the grade distributions and how, you know, what proportion of the grade is recoverable. Uh, and then reclamation, so acid rock drainage, um, deleterious compounds, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that, and there's much more to it if you want, you know, you can, you can add, add long lists of this. But the point is that all of that feeds into the actual value. So what is, what's the actual value of the deposit rather than just having a great 
trade and tonnage and 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 the current and the current stock price for for lead zinc silver and, and copper. Um, so ultimately, we're trying to model these metallurgical performance parameters, and I just listed a couple here. There's much more to it, but a couple of critical ones uh, that we need to, to model in, in, this, in this system are sulfur speciation, the clay content, uh, liberation of uh, particularly lead and, and then um, uh, galena, I should say, and then also the distribution of royalty slash penalty elements, so what you know, brings up your, your value and what, what, what would that could actually affect it negatively. So, um, just reduced to a simple diagram, uh, we're looking at it in space, the Baldwin Geomet model. At, at the moment, it, it includes uh, you know, lithology that we can identify pretty well with geochemistry, uh, the alterations, so there's these main different types of alteration, and then there's uh, oxide zones. So there's a surface oxide zone, and there, there's a couple of structurally controlled deeper um, deeper sulfur, um, oxide zones as well. So for each of these, you need to see how much of the actual resource resides within each of those blocks and the, the main ones we then need to, uh, to target to, to, to collect the composite data to actually then get metallurgical test work done on. So that's the story. We start with you know, lithology, alteration, and oxidation, and we, we feed that in together to define these geomet domains. Once we've defined which ones those are, and, and as, as Warren explained, we put like an, an, an estimate of how those domains are going to behave in the process, in the plant, um, then we can target the composite selection and the metallurgical testing. And while that's ongoing, uh, this will actually then also feed back into optimizing these, these models. Right? It's, not a, it's not a static thing, it's not a thing that you do once, it's an, it's an ongoing, evolving um, uh, yeah, uh, approach. So if you just looked at the logged lithology, of course there's several generations of, 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 of logging that went into this as well. Um, the main lithologies are really a, a tuff and a rhyolite, and in, compositionally they even look quite similar, um, so they're probably genetically related, but uh, you know, the, the last thing hasn't been said about that yet, but if you just plotted the log lithology, um, yeah, sure, you can see some domains, but it also looked like some holes, you know, the west-oriented holes may have been logged by different geologists than, than, than the east-oriented holes. So, you know, there's, there's some challenges here with using this straight up, as is, uh, to feed into a, uh, into a block model. So rather than doing that, um, you can also you look at the actual compositional domains in, in geochemical space, and uh, for this you really do need total digest or near total for acid digest um, to, to get these numbers. And uh, so, as much as I like Chris Gallagher, uh, and I think he's doing great work with his modeling of mineralization and alteration to find, uh, you know, to, to map out uh, mineralization to actually do this kind of work where you where you plot this up in you know here we have a calcium aluminum ratio and a potassium aluminum ratio um, to to get these kinds of clustering and this kinds of you know lithogeochemical model where you can actually have some confidence in putting a name on it uh, you need that that near total or uh, or total digest so and and uh, that said the the cost of uh, four acid digest has come down to be very equivalent to uh, to to uh, acreage digest as most labs so uh, my advice would be as soon as you're drilling uh, just be collecting the, the the whole rock data wherever you can um, complemented with LOI if you need to etc cetera, etc cetera. whatever you you, you What's, what, what's pertinent to the deposit. So here we've defined these um, seven domains that are compositionally different. Um, it's not just lithology, as I mentioned before, it's, uh, the lithology is pretty homogeneous in composition when you look at the, 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 the conserved elements, which is usually an, an approach you would take. Um, so here it's a combination really of, the, of the, the protolith and the alteration. So what you can see, if you break down this diagram, uh, the potassium aluminum ratio is a pretty common one. It's looking at potassium alteration. Uh, so to the right, it's more potassium altered. To the left, uh, well, around 0.3, there's the, um, the, the sericite node. And then if you go towards the origin, it could either be clay or quartz or, uh, or, or chloride. Well, actually, in this case, I've did remove the, the, I did remove the, the quartz and the, the massive sulfides to not confuse you on this diagram. Uh, so there's some you know, some probably argillic zones here, then there's sericitic and there's potassic zones. And then on the y-axis, we have the calcium aluminum ratio, which tells you something about the carbonate alteration. So carbonate alteration then further breaks that down. And you can see that there's this, you know, 
intermediate to strongly carbonate altered uh, uh, group at the, at the top there. So those are the warmer colors, are the carbonate alteration, and the, the, the blues and the greens are, um, you know, um, more potassic, the, the, the silicate alterations. And you can plot this in another diagram. Here we have, uh, sorry, back. So here we have, again, calcium. And you see that the effect of the calcium uh, bringing everything from that one-to-one -one line, which is, again, that potassium-aluminum ratio. So uh, here are the different, the different uh, um, compositional domains, again. And you can see how they're affected relative to, um, to the alteration. When you plot that in space, sorry. We got to speed up. When you plot that in space, you actually get uh, a much more detailed model that, or, well, input for a model that you can then use to to really break down um, what you have. The, ne the next thing, so apart from from lithology and alteration, um, is, uh, is is redox. And uh, what I forgot to mention in alteration is the idea, uh, is that that really affects sort of the the hardness and the grindability, the comminution parameters. Uh, when we look at redox, we're really looking at the how does oxidation affect the grade distribution? Because you all know about the supergene copper enrichment, uh, that can be a really nice thing until things go uh, from sulfides to oxides or <laughs> silicates or other things that are unrecoverable. So um, in this case. Um, now what you can do is you can, you can make a sum and you say, well, I'll take, you know, copper, lead, and zinc in the ratios that would reflect calcopyrite, cellarite, and galena, and, uh, and I plot that over sulfur in molar space, and I get a, a sense of what is, you know, what has a sulfur deficit. Where do we have more metal than the sulfide to actually make those minerals? And then I can, I can model that in space. So um, when you do that, actually here I, I converted the colors to, to represent in red, it's surface oxidation, and you can see this one hole that, that goes down the structure actually uh, shows some, you know, oxidation uh, to, to relative depths. Now, why is this important? Um, because it affects uh, what you can recover ultimately. And one of the, one of the issues we ran into and we like, and, and um, are, are being resolved right now is the is the, that on a geochem plot like this, where you just look at lead sulfur ratios, for instance. Um, Cerusite, you know, that would be easy to, to pick out because that's, that's gone to oxide, it's lost all its sulfur. But if you have anglicite, um, the sulfate equivalent of, uh, of you know, the, the lead sulfate, it has the same stoichiometric ratio as galena. So if you only look at the, 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 the straight up elements, um, you, you wouldn't see that the difference. So that's, and the same goes for covalite and, and, and calcantite. So if you have both those minerals present, like, or either or, um, the ratios would be the same. Anyway, so we built a geo, this, so this is our preliminary uh, geomet domains, and you can see this the start of pit uh, outlined, and then we have a quick cross section through it. This is uh, sized by lead, so you see the, you know, the massive sulfide carrying lots of lead, of course, and then this potassic zone is more copper rich, so you don't see much, so much lead. Uh, so that all goes into, um, you know, in, in, into, into informing the uh, composite selection and metallurgical work. So to conclude, um, recent efforts have again revived the historic Baldwin mine and include assessment of metallurgical parameters that, that impact the, the resource value. And uh, there is huge upside because so little work it historically has been done to actually expand the resource outside of its, uh, its, its known bounds. Um, and geochemical models for lithology and alteration and oxidation were used in this case study now, uh, uh, whose boundaries will be redefined by ongoing metallurgical test work and imminent structural model that's actually, yeah, did land in my inbox last night, but it's, so it's, it's work from uh, Jamie Robinson as well. Um, and then uh, drilling, mapping, testing, and modeling are, uh, ideally you would have them all sequential. Uh, they're all running in parallel and we're, you know, but we're updating, updating the model as we go, and at least the technology now allows us to do that, you know, on a daily basis, pretty much. So the whole point here of the geomet approach is to have increased knowledge and understanding about your ore deposits, so that will ultimately translate into lower operational risk. Thank you. Oh, and then I should, sorry, acknowledgement. I should acknowledge the people who allowed me to speak here today. So uh, not only CSA that uh, brought me into this work, but also uh, the Baldwin Joint Venture uh, listed here. So thank you. <laughs>